So we are recording and I am going to turn things over to Erin, who is going to be presenting for us on when the computers were women. All righty. Um, can you guys see me? I'm hoping you can see and hear me now. Um, yes. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so I'm excited to talk about this today. This is actually some research that I developed about three years ago. I did a talk at HondaJet, of all places, um, as part of an employee enrichment event that they were holding. And um, this came out about, you know, this started about the same time that the Hidden Figures book came out and just before the movie came out. They honestly, uh, so Margot Shetterly, the author, actually signed a movie contract before she ever even finished the book. So um, they almost came out at the exact same time. But um, I think it's a really interesting story. I, I'm guessing many of you have seen Hidden Figures. The book goes into a lot more detail on a lot of things than um, the movie, of course. But um, this is kind of a different look at the women human computers and specifically a look that's going to tie it in to um, UNCG because, you know, that's what I do. So let me let me let me share with you the video or this PowerPoint. And hopefully everyone can see that now. Awesome. Yes, I can see it. So um, let's set the stage. Awesome, cool. So let's get started by setting the stage for learning who these human computers were and why they were so vital to the development of engineering and spaceflight. So we're actually going to start in the 19 teens on the eve of World War I. This was a time of rapid cultural and technological development and change. In 1914, Robert Goddard began experiments in rocketry and the Panama Canal open. One year later, Einstein postulated his general theory of relativity, and Margaret Sanger was jailed as a, the author of Family Limitation, the first popular book about birth control. Frederick Winslow Taylor, father of scientific management, died, while disciples like Henry Ford were actually applying his ideas in the process of achieving prodigies of production. Ford produced his one millionth automobile in the same year. And in 1915, Alexander Graham Bell made the first transcontinental phone call from New York to San Francisco with his uh, trusted colleague, Dr. Watson, on the other end of the line. Motion pictures were beginning to reshape the American entertainment uh, habits and New Orleans jazz music began to make an indelible imprint on American music. So at this exact same time, at Sheepheads Bay in New York, a new speed record for automobiles was set at a whopping 102.6 miles per hour, a figure that many aviation enthusiasts during this time would have like been thrilled to match. Um, the, the cars were going much faster than the planes at this point. So in the aviation field in the United States, leaders found themselves trailing behind their European counterparts. Yes, as we all know, because of our license plates, the Wright brothers were the first to make a powered airplane flight in 1903 in Kitty Hawk, but that feat received actually very little attention in American newspapers. It wasn't until about five, year, five years later in 1908 when Orville made some trial flights for the War Department and Wilbur started making flights overseas that um, Europe and many American newspapers really started paying them any attention at all. But aviation enthusiasts in the United States wanted more. At the inaugural meeting of the American Aeronautical Society in 1911, some of its members discussed a national laboratory with federal patronage. A number of organizations, including the Smithsonian Institution, the US Navy, and MIT, saw great promise in aviation as a research frontier. The American public, however, didn't really rally around this cause. While there were some folks who saw it as a mechanical triumph with a significant future, others saw it as a fad and a really dangerous one at that. If anything, the antics of the so-called bird men and aviatrixes of the era tended to underscore the foolhardiness of aviation and airplanes. 
Flyers might set a record one month and then fatally crash the next. This is Calbraith P. Rogers. He managed to make the first flight um, from the Atlantic to the Pacific Coast in 1911, a 49-day journey, but then he died in a crash just four months later. Harriet Quimby was the first woman to fly across the English Channel in 1912, but she died in a crash off the Boston coast within three months of her return to America. British, German, and French organizations, on the other hand, grew and developed new technologies, typically with the strong support of industry and governments. In 1914, a report issued by researchers working on behalf of the Smithsonian Institution emphasized the vast disparity between the Europeans' progress in aviation and the relative inertia in the United States. This report was, of course, issued against the backdrop of war in Europe. A war that really was the first to make use of these new aviation technologies. The use of German dirigibles for long range bombing of British cities and the rapid evolution of airplanes for reconnaissance and for pursuit underscored the shortcomings of American aviation. Against this background, Charles D. Walcott pushed for legislative action to provide for aeronautical research allowing the United States to match progress overseas. Walcott received support from progressive leaders in the country who viewed government agencies for research as consistent with progressive ideals such as scientific inquiry and technological progress. And by the spring of 1915, the drive for an aeronautical research organization in the U.S. finally succeeded. The legislation creating the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, N-A-C-A, was attached as a rider to the Naval Appropriation Bill um, in that year, in 1915. So unlike NASA, NACA began without anyone really paying it much attention. It started simply with a chairman. His name was Brigadier General George Scriven. Um, he was chief of the Army's Signal Corps, and he also had a main committee of 12 members that represented the government, military, and industry, and then an executive committee chosen from that that was seven members. There was one employee, actual one actual employee dedicated to it. His name was awesomely John F. Victory. Committee members were not paid. Again, Mr. Victory was the only person who was paid. And all these committee members were pretty much serving in an advisory capacity. They would meet a few years, few times a year and direct the aim of the new organization. Two years later, in 1917, construction began in Norfolk, Virginia on the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory. A formal dedication ceremony took place on June 11th, 1920. The inaugural ceremonies included various aeronautical exhibitions and a flyover of a large formation of planes led by the dashing Brigadier General Billy Mitchell. Visitors found that NACA's corner of Langley Field was comparatively modest. There was an atmospheric wind tunnel, a dynamometer can't, I can never say that word, dynamometer lab, a, an in administrative building, and a small warehouse. The engineers came to Langley from all over the country. Early employees often had degrees in civil or mechanical engineering because honestly there just weren't very many universities that offered a degree in aeronautical engineering. By the end of the 1920s though this began to change. From a handful of pre-war courses dealing with aeronautical engineering, universities like MIT evolved a full plan of professional coursework that was to lead to both undergraduate and graduate degrees on the subject. The Daniel Guggenheim Fund for the Promotion of Aeronautics provided money for similar programs at several other schools. By the time Charles Lindbergh made his solo flight from New York to Paris in 1927, an aeronautical infrastructure was already in place. The Lindbergh boom in public interest in aviation that followed his achievement couldn't have been sustained without the important progress of these previous years. The design characteristics of the 1920s, that was basically fabric covered biplanes with radial engines, gave way to truly sophisticated airplanes of the 1930s, planes with streamlined shapes, metal construction, retractable landing gear, and higher performance. The research and advancements were of course of benefit to the military, but they were also benefiting the civilian aviation areas. Beginning in the mid 1930s, however, on the eve of the Second World War, 
military aviation work began to move to center stage at NACA. So they were leaving behind kind of the civilian and military co-focus and just going with military aviation as a focus. John J. Ide, who managed NACA's listening post in Europe, reported unusually strong commitments to aeronautical research in Italy and Germany, where no less than five research centers were already under development. Germany's largest, which was located near Berlin, had a reported 2,000 personnel at work, compared to Langley's 350 people. Although the fascist powers were developing civilian aircraft, it became apparent really quickly that military research absorbed the lion's share of work at these centers. In 1936, the agency put together a special committee on the relationship of NACA to national defense in a time of war. Its report, which was released two years later in 1938, called for expanded facilities in the form of a new laboratory an action that was underscored by Charles Lindbergh, who had just returned from a European tour and warned that Germany clearly surpassed America in military aviation technology. A follow-up committee recommended that the new facility should be located on the West Coast, where it could work closely with the growing aircraft industry in California and Washington. So following a congressional debate, NACA received money for expanded facilities at Langley in Virginia, along with a new laboratory at Moffett Field, which is south of San Francisco. The official authorization came in August 1939. Only a few weeks later, German planes, tanks, and troops invaded Poland. It's also in the immediate pre-war World War II years, um, with this ramping up of Langley and its military aviation focus, that we see the women working as human computers who came to NACA. So just to back up a little bit, the term computer dates back to the 17th century when it literally meant someone who computes or someone who does mathematical computations. From its earliest days, women were working as computers. In fact, most men saw being a computer as a temporary job. It was something you would do until a better job came along. It wasn't until the 19th century, though, that the area was truly like carved out just and considered to be women's work. In the late 19th century, the Harvard College Observatory employed a group of women who collected, studied, cataloged thousands of images of stars on glass plates. These women were known as the Harvard computers, and one of the women, Wilhelmina Fleming, was actually the first to recognize the existence of white dwarf stars. The computers hired by NACA on the eve of World War II continued this tradition. In 1935, five women were hired to read calculate and plot data from tests in Langley's wind tunnel and research divisions. The first computers at Langley, organized into a central office in the administration building, took on calculating work that had previously been done by the engineers themselves. According to a 1942 report, computing sections were designed to process test data more efficiently and relieve engineers of this essential but time-consuming work. A 1942 document on the organization and practice of computing groups explained that engineers were then were now free to devote their attention to other aspects of research projects. And then it also praised the computers for calculating data, quote, more rapidly and accurately, doing more in a, in a morning than an engineer alone could finish in an entire day. The qualifications required of the women who uh, applied to be computers varied, but everyone had to take the civil service exam. In the 1940s, computers were classified as sub-professionals. They made between uh, $1,440 per year as a junior computer, up to about $3,200 per year as a chief computer. Most of the women hired at Langley had a bachelor, bachelor's degree, and many of the former computers have noted in interviews that men with similar degrees and qualifications were instead classified as junior engineers, which was a professional classification and had a starting salary of $2,600 per year compared to the $1,400 for a junior computer. Working as a computer, despite its subprofessional status, honestly paid a lot better than the majority of jobs that would have been available to women in the 1940s and 50s. It also provided an entry for women into the field of aeronautical research at a time when most simply weren't going to be hired as engineers solely because they were women. It offered one of the very few career options besides teaching for women who had degrees in math and sciences. 
Additionally, unlike most employers at the time, NACA allowed women to continue employment once they were married and even when they were raising a family. In 1943, they actually even opened a daycare facility for the children of the women who worked as computers at Langley. While the specific tasks that a computer did varied according to both need and her department, the majority of computing work involved three components, reading film, running calculations, and plotting data. During wind tunnel tests, manometer boards would measure pressure changes using liquid filled, liquid -filled tubes. The computers would then read the photographic films of the manometer readings and record that data into their worksheets. Working individually for a single engineer or collectively as an entire computing section, these women then ran different types of calculations to analyze the data and plot the results on graph paper. You know, keep in mind, all of this work was done by hand using slide rules, curves, magnifying glasses, and basic calculating machines, which could basically multiply or calculate a square root, but not do much of anything more than that. Once completed, the calculations, graphs, and other information were checked for accuracy and then sent back to the engineer to design the next series of tests. So why did NACA specifically target women as their human computer hires? As I mentioned earlier, by the early 20th century, computing was pretty much thought of as women's work and computers were assumed to be women. Respected mathematicians would actually blithely approximate the uh, problem solving horsepower of their computing machines in girl years and calculate a unit of machine labor as equal to one kilo girl. The work was seen as secondary to the more important work, um, the research and engineering work, the work that was done by men. And honestly, of course, as I mentioned before, women could be hired into these jobs doing this work at a significantly cheaper rate than men with the exact same educational qualifications. And with few other opportunities of the sort, these women were less likely to move away for greener pastures. Women were also seen as better suited in terms of temperament for detailed monotonous work. Um, they were believed to be better able to work on a, fo on a focused project for a sustained period of time. And honestly, this is actually my favorite reason that I read someone give for hiring women as human computers. Some folks actually argued that a woman's smaller hands made, it, made her more physically adept at rapid fire use of calculators. It was in this environment that Virginia Tucker was hired along with five other women as the first human computers at NACA in 1935. This is Virginia Tucker. Virginia Layden Tucker of Hertford, North Carolina, arrived on the campus of the North Carolina College for Women, now UNCG, in the fall of 1926, and she quickly established herself as a leader among her peers. In her senior year, she served as president of the Adelphian Literary Society, as well as the college fire chief. As college fire chief, she organized a fire drill in Spencer Dormitory in April 1930 that garnered praise from Greensboro Fire Chief Shaw, who specifically congratulated her on, quote, the conduct of the students and their good training. Two months later in June 1930, Tucker graduated with a major in mathematics and a minor in education. After graduation, she worked as a high school math teacher in her hometown of Hertford, but she also took the civil service exam in the hopes of applying for a job with the federal government. She always kind of knew that teaching wasn't really what she wanted to do with her life. This is how in September of 1935, she found herself as one of the first members of NACA's computer pool. The pool was modeled on stenographic pools and NACA administrators felt that this group, specifically working as a distinct cohesive group, would more efficiently process the growing amount of data issuing from flight research and experiments in the lab's wind tunnels. Only 25 women total were on the large staff at Langley when Tucker and the new computers arrived in 1935. And those 25, almost all of them were serving as administrative assistants. But the number expanded greatly during World War II as men were drafted away from military service. Tucker herself helped recruit many of the women who became human computers, traveling to universities and women's colleges across the South. Administrators at UNC Greensboro wrote to Tucker asking, quote, how many girls do you need? And she would respond simply, as many as you can send. 
Tucker worked closely with Langley's personnel director, Melvin Butler, and engineers such as Eldridge Daring to recruit and train these talented women and establish computing standards that were used not only at Langley, but at newer NACA centers in Ohio and California. In 1941, the computing roles, as well as the other roles in the defense industry, were open for the first time to African-American applicants. A. Philip Randolph, the leader of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the largest black labor union in the country, threatened a massive wash on, march on Washington if President Roosevelt didn't open the lucrative government war jobs to African-Americans. Later that year, Roosevelt signed two executive orders one that ordered the desegregation of the defense industry, and one that created the Fair Employment Practices Committee to monitor the national project of economic inclusion. Two years later, NACA hired its first group of African-American women human computers, including uh, the woman in this picture, Dorothy Vaughn, who was actually portrayed by um, Octavia Spencer in the Hidden Figures movie. Um, but back to Vir Virginia Tucker. By 1946, Tucker had advanced to the position of overall supervisor for computing at Langley. She was tasked with managing a department of over 400 women in computing sections across the laboratory facility. She was directly responsible for all of the women working in the East computing section, the central pool of white women that was located in the administrative building, um, and then moved to actually a space that used to be a pressure tunnel. She also oversaw the head computers of all other groups, including those located in individual wind tunnels and the all African American West area computers. But head of the computing pool was pretty much the limit for a woman at NACA at this time. NACA had no female engineers. Pearl Young, who was the first and only woman engineer at NACA prior to the 1950s, had been hired as an engineer in 1922, but was quickly re reassigned to be the chef, chief, techno uh, chief technical editor, basically a PR person um, and report writer in 1929. After 12 years with NACA, Tucker left civil service for a position as an aeronautical engineer at Northrop Corporation in Hawthorne, California. Specifically, Tucker's engineering research was focused on boundary layers and increased airplane efficiency. She wrote to Women's College Alumni Office in 1954 that, quote, my work is most interesting and I'm privileged to be working with a group of specialists, many of whom have immigrated here from Austria, Switzerland, France, and Germany since 1945. In addition to her work at Northrop, Tucker was a leader in advocating for women in the engineering fields. She was elected director of the Los Angeles section of the Society of Women Engineers in 1955, and she chaired the Society's National Finance Committee from 1955 to 1956. Then in 1957, she served as their representative to the LA Technical Society's Council. In October of 1957, she participated as the principal speaker in a panel discussion at UCLA titled, The Woman Engineer in Modern Industrial Society. Now, during this same time, um, the Women's College, UNCG, also began to expand its curriculum to provide its students with more experience in aviation work. In the fall 1946 course catalog, the physics department added a new class to its listings. Elements of aeronautics allowed WC students to not only understand the principle of aeronautics, but also to actually learn how to fly an airplane from instructors at the Hawthorne Flying Service at um, the Greensboro High Point Airport, now PTI. An article in the Greensboro Daily News noted that, quote, the course as outlined will be one of the first of its kind in the country, and Women's College will be one of the few girls schools in the nations to offer flying to its students. The course was led by Dr. Anna Reardon, head of the physics department. Prerequisites included at least one year of mathematics, one year of physics, and written permission from the students' parents. In the first semester offered, um, seven students signed up for the class. Students began with on-campus classes at the Science Building, um, focused on navigation, aerodynamics, aircraft, meteorology, and air regulations. They also received instruction on how to read maps, chart courses, and study wind drifts. 
The classroom learning provided the necessary groundwork for the flying lessons that followed. A minimum of one afternoon per week, each member of the class had to catch the Winston-Salem bus from the WC campus over to the Greensboro High Point Airport for a half hour flying lesson from one of four instructors of the Hawthorne Flying Service. An article in the Carolinian student newspaper made special note that, quote, for flying, the girls wear slacks, blue jeans, or army tans. Initial flying lessons focused on straight and level flying. As the student newspaper reported, quote, among the most astonishing things to these flyers was running a straight course to discover the plane flying straight at an angle because the wind was blowing. Instead of holding a steady course down the airstrip on takeoff, the students would go to one side, almost getting off the runway. Once they mastered their straight and level flying and adjustments to wind drifts, the students moved on to more complicated things like banking and turning. By the end of the course, the students demonstrated their skills with pylon eights, which were described in the Carolinian as, quote, ice skating eights in an airplane with two houses as the center of each loop. The Women's College Aviation, Aviation course disappeared from the course bulletin in the 1955-56 year. Um, at a time when Virginia Tucker was still working at Northrop, serving as the, so the Society of Women Engineers president and advocating for women to enter the aviation field. Um, that said, to kind of conclude Virginia Tucker's story, in 1965, after 17 years at Northrop, Tucker returned home to Hertford and served as the supervisor of instruction and evaluation in Perkimmons County. When she left, Northrop actually had to hire two different men engineers to replace her and take over her work to see the same amount of product. Tucker held her position in Perkimmons County until her retirement in 1974. She passed away 11 years later at the age of 75. Her niece, in a description that makes me honestly really sad that I never got to hang out with Virginia Tucker, described her Aunt Jenna as her, quote, chatty bourbon drinking, bridge playing, high church, ham cooking, math loving spinster aunt. So, as anyone who has seen or read um, Hidden Figures knows, the women human computers at NACA and later NASA continued their important and often, often unappreciated um, work long after Tucker's departure from Langley in 1946. The Bell Electronic Computer, which was a massive computing machine that Langley, um, NACA and Langley acquired in 1947, they had their own computing group that was headed by a woman named Sarah Bullock. The women in this group were in charge of um, programming the machine, which used punch tapes of data to run calculations for transonic aerodynamic uh, equations. When Christine Darden was hired as a computer in 1967, she actually had not only, art, she had already studied computer programming in college, and she worked there for about five years in NACA, but doing computing work and programming work, but she got really frustrated because she knew that she wasn't gonna get any kind of promotion. Eventually, they transferred her over to Sonic Boom Research, but it was a parallel promotion. She actually went on to earn a PhD in engineering and became one of the very first women um, engineers hired during this area, and she was placed in the uh, supersonic aerodynamic section. Darden was actually, when she was hired in 67, one of the final human computers to be hired at NASA. Um, by that point in the mid 60s, the actual computer machines themselves were becoming a little bit more reliable um, and more heavily integrated into the scientific work. So um, that's, that's your introduction to the time when the computers were women, um, as well as one of my favorite people, Virginia Tucker. Um, Jenny, I, I have not been keeping up with the chat, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to, um, to answer them. Yeah, I haven't seen any questions come up, um, but absolutely, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to put those in the chat. If you want to unmute yourself, that's also fine. Um, if you would rather ask that way, and we'll just kind of let things sit for a moment here and see if folks have any questions to ask. I'll answer a question that I've been asked before when talking about this, which is how did, how did I find the information about Virginia Tucker? Um, Virginia Tucker is, um, 
you know, if, if, if you're coming into university archives, one of the things that's challenging is finding information about alumni. We have some information about them when they were students. Um, you know, we have the Carolinian newspaper, we have yearbooks, we have things like that. But for the most part, once someone leaves campus, we don't have a lot of information about them unless they kind of cycle back around and become a faculty member or, um, you know, so, something else along those lines. We, gosh, now this was probably about seven years ago. Uh, what is time now? Time runs together. I don't know even what day it is, much less what year it is. Um, but about six or seven years ago, we actually started transferring some old files from um, the Becker Weaver warehouse space um, that's off campus, off Spring Garden, for those who know where that is. It's near the train tracks off of Spring Garden. Um, the Alumni Association actually had these files that they kept of um, all the alumni who would write back to the Alumni Association. There was the Alumni Association secretary and all of these were files that she kept when people would write to her with, you know, an update on their life or whatever was going on. And one of the files that was in there that we happened to keep was Virginia Tucker's. Um, Herman, actually, uh, Troyanowski, for those who know Herman, um, this was a large part of his immediate post-retirement. You know, as we all know, Herman retired, but thankfully has never left us. Um, and so one of his post-retirement jobs was sorting through these files. And so when we found Virginia Tucker, I was very, very excited. Um, and it's come in super handy since then, because if y'all remember about three years ago, I believe it was, um, Margot Lee Shetterly, who wrote the Hidden Figures book, was our commencement speaker. And I was able to make a connection with her when she came to town. And um, she's working on kind of expanding that project. And so we're looking at tracing all of the WC women who then went on to work as computers um, for NAS NACA or NASA after that. And so these are coming, these files that Herman worked on have, have come in really handy with doing that. Um, some of the women who were hired in the 50s from WC are still around and kicking. Most of them live near Virginia, near Langley, still near Norfolk. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. And the belief, at least for the folks who were hired at Langley as computers, is that WC actually was the source it was the, the college that had the most alumni working um, as computers of any college across the country. Um, the only other one that kind of came close, they think, is um, Hampton, uh, an Af uh, HBCU that's near there, where they hired most of the African-American women computers from. Right. I'm not seeing any questions coming out, but some some hoorays for Herman, you know, which you know is always appropriate. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a week when we when things were more normal. I can't think of a week when I didn't see Herman in the library. So um, <laughs> he's there. He's always there. I hope he's not there right now, obviously. But <laughs> all right, y'all. If no one has any questions, uh, I'm going to do my usual thing and paste the, oh, let, me, let me find it, too many things open as usual, um, and paste um, our little assessment form. Um, and y'all have been great about filling out these forms for us, and uh, it really helps us um, as we are planning future sessions. So. Um, this was really interesting. Yes, thank you so much, Erin. And I want to thank everybody for participating and um, learning about this cool stuff. Um, we are going to be taking a break from the ULVLC next week, except for our uh, weekly reading club, um, which is like four of us. So um, we're going to do that, but we're going to take a break from all other sessions. But we will be picking back up uh, the week uh, of Memorial Day. And I see that we've got, I think, still here. Yes, Audrey and Suzanne will be presenting that week. 
uh, a session called Beyond the Donut, which I'm very excited about. Um, so I hope that everyone will continue to join us for future ULVLC sessions. And um, I just want to say thanks again to Erin and to everybody for participating. And I'm going to go ahead and close things down in just a moment here, but please feel free to always email me if you have questions.